everyone and welcome back. If you recall in the planning video for my Victorian New Woman Aziraphale cosplay, I did mention that I wanted to make shoes for this, but wasn't sure if I was going to have the time. Well, obvious by the fact that you are watching this video, I did manage to find the time somehow in the middle of all of that insanity and getting ready for the trip, I managed to squeeze in an entire pair of shoes. And actually more than that, because this is such an unusual era for shoes, the mid 1890s is unlike any other time period in any other shape, I don't have a good set of lasts for this shape. While the last that I've used for 1900s and mostly 19 teens does actually currently have a built up long pointed toe on it, much like the 1890s, it is meant for a heel that is far too tall and it would look really silly for me to put it on a lower heel. So I needed to make a very similar shape of last, which did mean that I already knew a little bit of the curves and the process for this one, but it needed to work for a heel that was more like an inch, inch and a half, which meant that I had to make a new pair of lasts before I could even get started on making the shoes, which is also the reason that I decided that bicycle boots were not going to be happening for this project. They require so much time and effort, and they are incredibly iconic of this era. In fact, most of the references that you see for bicycle boots start up in 1895, 96, and by 1901, they fade out. And it's not really surprising the style of the shoe shape changed so much around that 1900 point. And I actually found an article that mentions them still trying to make bicycle boots with the more rounded toe and the higher heel, and that they just frankly looked weird. And that makes perfect sense. These are something that balance well with the long pointed toe and low heel. I don't think they really look balanced nor serve the level of practicality that was necessary in order to continue riding bicycles or even just being super active in these shoes. Because bicycling actually peaked really quickly in the 1890s as the thing to do for a while. And it's not that it didn't stick around. Obviously bicycles are still very popular today. It's just the obsessive fad over them was really distinct to that era and they settled down into being a practical thing. In the 1890s, they were also really obsessed over just anything to do with sports and health, getting out, being active, and they were very encouraging of increasingly practical garments, more tailored things, simpler things, lighter weight things. This is also when we start to lose all of those layers of petticoats and fluff, and they end up with much more practical options for every single part of the garment. So overall, they were encouraging a lot of really good, healthy life choices at the time. Speaking of good life choices, I want to introduce the sponsor of this week's video, Thrive Market. Thrive Market is an online subscription-based grocery store with a great array of options that make healthy living easier and more affordable. I started looking into Thrive Market recently to help me find a better selection of options. I have had health problems recently that rely on me having easy and effective food options around the home that help make my days run better. But spending hours wandering around the grocery store looking at nutrition labels is not going to be a pleasant choice and I was struggling to find options that would work for me. Instead, I can filter the catalog of products on Thrive Market by aisle, types, brands, and even diet and lifestyle, whether that's peanut or gluten-free food or fragrance-free house products. When it comes to cost, they have the lowest prices out there. They'll even price match. You can do a month-to-month -month membership for $12 a month or an annual for $5 a month paid all at the one time, so you don't have to think about it again. And if you don't make back that $60 in annual membership, they'll credit you the difference at the end of the year. I saved more than $12 on my first order that came out to less than $60, so it's not difficult to make up the membership quickly. I am honestly completely sold on how easy and effective this is. So many new products being added all the time, simple searches, all orders over $49 ship for free, and they have carbon neutral shipping and zero waste warehouses. And to top it all off, their Thrive Gives initiative donates a free membership to those in need with every paid annual membership. Just click the link in my description or go to thrivemarket.com slash Nicole Rudolph and get 30% off of your first order and get a free gift worth up to $60 when you join Thrive Market today. Thanks again to Thrive Market for sponsoring this week's video and allowing me to keep going on all of these crazy projects I keep adding onto my schedule. It never ends. And I honestly don't know how I managed to fit this project into the time that I had allotted. Not only did I have to carve out and shape down those lasts, but the boots that I ended up making were fairly complex and I did as many shortcuts as I possibly could. 
Though, like I said, I wasn't going to be taking care of the bicycle boots this round, I didn't want such an expensive and time-consuming piece to be made on a brand new left that I have never really gotten a chance to fully test before. Instead, though, I made my way towards a shorter, simpler boot. A zero fill in the series does wear a pair of boots and they are two-toned, the tan and the brown. I really liked those colors. I really liked that element of the short boot. So I wanted to carry that over. And short boots and Oxfords were incredibly popular for women in this era, but they came in so many different styles. And I particularly fell in love with this pair of boots, which is pretty simple in reality. There's a lot going on with the scroll work and the shaping, but honestly, I'm going to have to do a fair bit of work with seams and shapes anyway, so it doesn't add too much time and effort to the whole thing. I am using an original pair of boots that I have in my collection for reference throughout this whole process in order to understand how the uppers could be put together. There are so many ways to do a single pair of shoes from any era, so there's not one right way. This is just a way that a pair of boots was made, and I use that as information when making mine. So most of the techniques that I'm using come from that original pair. The style comes from the Museum pair. I altered the design just so slightly to make it look a little bit more like angel wings, which I thought was a really fun feature of that. But this is also where things started getting really difficult really quickly, as if it wasn't enough already to be doing everything. I knew that I could shortcut the construction methods and be cementing everything together rather than taking the time to do all of the hand stitching and welting and all the crazy stuff like I did for the pair of Oxfords back in the fall, which that was hours and hours of stitching and finishing and effort put into every tiny little detail of that pair of shoes. Instead, I'm relying on that scroll work feature to be the main thing, and I'm just going to cement the whole shoe together really quickly. And it's not historically inaccurate as a construction method, though the stitching is more typical. The uppers, though, were where I was going to put my focus, which meant that I needed the right supplies. And that was where the first really big problem cropped up, because uh, this project <laughs> fought me every step along the way. <laughs> first off, I couldn't find a good leather. All of the places that I usually buy from, they have a great stock of leather, but pretty much every single place was out of that color, was out of that weight and general style of leather. I couldn't find anything that I wasn't going to either have to skive down to a much thinner level, which I don't have a machine for and takes forever to do by hand, was not going to be the right color or the right finishing style. So I ended up finding a good weight of leather that had a good stretch to it that was relatively unfinished, which meant that I could pretty easily dye it and finish it and take it through that process without having to strip it down first. So that would save me a step in the long run. And I have dyed leather before, but I am by no means an expert on this. This is not something I have a lot of experience with, so it's a little bit scary a little bit challenging, and it did present some problems along the way. I have learned a lot in this project, as I do with all of my projects. And I'm glad that I took that challenge on. I really love how everything turned out at the end, but between finding a decent leather and dyeing the leather, finding a fabric that would work and be the right color range for what I needed, finding all the supplies, making up the last and getting started, I was running up against the clock on this. So in the end, I only had a about a week to make this pair of boots, starting from the point of having the last done while I was trying to get everything else wrapped up and finished at the same time, because I still had lots of little project pieces to do and some finishing and a need to get photography of everything done before I packed it away and left on the trip. So looking back, I honestly don't know how I managed to cram all that in, but in the end, they turned out absolutely lovely and I cannot wait to share them with you. Starting off with designing the last, I was using that original boot as the inspiration for the shape, but it is quite a bit smaller than my foot size, so I knew I was going to have to size things up. Like I said, I've also done a last that is somewhat similar in shape before, so I have a reference point for how these curves are supposed to be proportioned out. So using a tracing of my foot and a tracing of the smaller shoe, I am sort of combining the two in a way, figuring out roughly what the footprint should be for the last first. 
Then I can go in and figure out the side silhouette and start shaping out what I need that to be in terms of my own foot size and proportions. So this is all just a rough idea of where the last will end up in the end because it's going to take a fair amount of working down in order to get it to the right measurements. It is of course helpful to look at the last that I already have that I know fits me for comparison, make sure that it is pretty close in terms of the overall measurements. And then it's on to carving things down, getting a really basic block shape to start, and then working down corners here and there until I start sanding everything down to get the right curves and get everything smoothed out. And this is a point where I will start removing little bit by little bit by little bit in order to get the measurements right to fit my feet. Once I have a matching pair, which is a feet unto itself, <laughs> I am taking the pattern off of the lass. So I'm using masking tape for this part of the process because I find that to be the easiest, especially when I'm trying to draw a design on there and figure out exactly how I want things to be proportioned out. And then I simply cut down through all the seam lines and remove the masking tape pieces. And those will get laid out flat onto a sheet of paper. They won't be perfectly flat because inevitably in the end, I'll be using leather and leather stretches and can go over curves. These are complex curves, but I will end up with a fairly close pattern that I can then take the time to draw out and clean up. This only went up to the ankle point of the last. So I need to figure out how much taller I want the boot to be and come up with all those designs, how big for the ankle, lots of different curves curves, so much more information that gets imparted, and then the final design gets cut out of a Bristol board or heavier cardstock. That's because I want really nice clean edges when I go to trace this out on the fabric and on the leather. This is a really complex design and I need it super clear. This also allows me to add in seam allowance so that way I'm not drawing a line on the leather that might show. Unlike working on fabric where I can use chalk or things that are very temporary, marking a line on the leather, it's going to indent somewhat. So I want to actually add the seam allowance here. And then if I need to, I can go back and actually cut out little dashes where I want the stitches to be. So that way I can mark those later without having to worry about it showing through. I can do that on the wrong side. But for right now, I just need the larger shapes. So I'm tracing everything out onto the leather before I dye it. So that way I can track what areas actually need to be dyed, not wasting a whole bunch of effort trying to keep things from being streaky and pooling in different areas. I am not the best at this and it took me a few different layers to get up to the level that I wanted. But once I got pretty close to what I wanted, I went ahead and cut everything out, retracing those lines so they were extra clear. And then I put one final layer of the dye on top of this to make sure that I got every single little corner and little speck of everything as smooth as possible. I did end up with a streakier finish, but honestly, I kind of like it. It looks a little wood-like. I'm okay with that. I do want to try and uh, figure out ways to do different techniques in the future though. Then it was time to start assembly. So I'm cutting out a cotton tool for the lining, which is going to cover the vast majority of the interior. There are a few spots where there'll be some leather. There's a little strip that goes down the center back seam in order to add reinforcement to the interior. There's definitely a lot of reinforcement in the original pair that I'm basing this off of. So get ready for more and more added in. For example, the top line. There's not only a Petersham ribbon that runs around the top, but also a piece of linen canvas inside. I used a beetle linen for mine, so that way it's nice and thin, but very stiff. And that gets folded over and top stitched via zigzag stitch to the top of the lining. And then a strip of leather gets added down around where the front is going to open so that way it's reinforced for all of the eyelets that will be in there. This is the same leather that I was using for the outer portions, but I didn't dye it because I was worried that the dye might rub off on any stockings. Next up, cutting out the silk, which is just a ribbed silk. And I'm using a little bit of double-sided sticky tape that's meant for shoemaking and leather work in order to place the little leather applique in the right spot and not have it move and shift around while I'm sewing. I didn't find that it did that too much, but you can never be too safe, especially when I'm working on something this complicated. I also had to use a different foot than usual so I could actually see exactly where I was headed with my stitches. So my regular sewing foot just hid a about a quarter of an inch from what I could see, and I was going off the edges way too easily. Once those pieces are on and I have four of the correct ones, which um, I'm not gonna lie to you, I definitely made three left sides on this one instead of two lefts and two rights, but you know, we're not gonna talk about that too much. I, I, I went back and fixed it. Take care of the center back seam, top stitching that. It doesn't add any strength, but it does hold down the seam allowance really well. 
and make sure that that stays flat and won't pop up and rub against the back of your ankle. And then it's time to start adding the lining to the exterior. The tops get stitched together right side to right side, the Petersham ribbon to the exterior, and then that gets flipped down and top stitched. I am waiting to the very last bit in order to put the vamp on the toe area. It does have a little bit of a decorative element on top, which is also a bit of a reinforcement because there's not a separate toe cap reinforcement inside of the shoe. The two layers of leather that are in the toe now are enough to take care of that. It's at this point that I can go ahead and stitch the vamp onto the quarters. Two layers of top stitching for all of this. But thankfully, no pinking or broguing or anything crazy this time. And then the last step in stitching together is to go down the front openings and get the lining attached to the exterior along that line. It's weird and complex the way that I have to do this because I have a regular sewing machine rather than the type that's meant for shoemaking. So just run with me on this. But now I'm at the point where I can start doing all of the eyelets. I have a little cardboard version of this. It makes it easier for me to mark things out. And then once I go through and poke a little hole, I double check and mark with my punch tool before I punch things out, making sure that it looks lined up and then punch through all the layers. I'm using the same punch tool to kind of open up that hole just a little bit further to get the eyelet through all of the layers because we have quite a bit going on inside of there. And these are, yes, just eyelets, not grommets. That's what's on the original. That's what I'm finding historically, very commonly used. They're also really tiny. It's hard to find grommets that small. Once the uppers are fully assembled, it's time to move on to the rest of the shoe. The insole is where I'm starting with this one because I can get a rough shape cut out and then add it to the last. I soaked the leather for a good day before, so it's really pliable and shapeable. And this allows me to get it formed over the curves of the last and cut down really precisely. Then I'm going through because this is an insole and paring down those edges so that way they're really nice and smooth and angled. They're not gonna be really thick around the edges causing ridges up against the fabric on the exterior. But having this shape will allow me to have a very precise shape for the outsole. That is something that I want to have pre-cut and somewhat pre-finished because it's going to be just simply cemented onto the exterior. I don't want to have to cut it down and shape it on the last if possible. That should be just ready to slap on and go. So I simply took the insole and then made the outsole a little bit bigger around all the edges, expecting it to stick out from the shoe just a little bit. I did make a mistake here in the fact that I didn't make the heel area big enough in back, but uh, we'll come back around to why that's a big problem later. I am also working down the edges on this just a little bit. They'll be much thicker than the insole that I was trying to pare down to almost nothing, but I didn't want it to be full thickness on the edges. This looks a little bit nicer, a little bit lighter weight if I don't have the full width of the leather showing on the exterior. It's a bit of a secret to make shoes look much lighter weight and smaller than they actually are. Then I need to make sure that I've gotten the heel cup shaped out. This is a reinforcement that will get inserted into the layers of the upper, but it's better if it's got some shaping already done. It's also better since it's really wet right now that I'm not putting a completely soaked through piece of leather up against my uppers, which can stain and change color and you know, working with silk if I'm getting those wet. So ideally that's already sort of shaped to where it needs to be and it's pretty dry. And then it's time to start lasting. First things first, because this is a boot, I do need to tie those holes shut. I don't want a giant gap on top when I'm pulling things tight around the last because then it won't fit my foot properly. So you do need to individually tie those though. If you just lace it up like a regular shoe, it can pull back and forth and change proportions as you go if you're pulling on one area more than others. So each one of those needs to be tied up over the top of the foot and then a few at the top for extra security. Then it's time to get to lasting. I'm starting off with all of my layers together just to get a rough idea of where this is going to be situated. The important thing right now is to get everything lined up. Center back seam on the center back, the toe centered up over the top, the two side seams lined up like they need to be around the body, making sure that it's not skewed right or left, counterclockwise, clockwise, whatever way you want to look at it, making sure that it is symmetrical as much as it can be for the fact that it is a right or left shoe and everything's placed well. 
Then I'm removing a few of the tacks bit by bit and I'm going in and doing each layer separately. This is really important because that leather is not going to stretch in the same way that that cotton twill is going to stretch. And that's how you end up with wrinkles inside of your shoe. So you want to start with just the lining separately, making sure that everything is in place and pulled correctly. If you pull too hard from one way, it's going to pull the other way. So I can't pull super tight at the toe. Otherwise it's going to cause pulls on the body, making sure that I'm working out all of those wrinkles as I go back and forth, back and forth, evenly splitting the two sides of the body. You can see there, there's a little bit of extra space over the top that I need to pull out, make sure that I get that pulled far forward. And this is the complex stuff that you can't do if you are trying to do all the layers at once. We have a really nice, clean, wrinkle-free lining there, so I can pop the tacks off of a couple areas and start to add in the cement. The way that cement works versus glue is that it's contact-based, so you paint on the two layers, let them air dry until they are no longer sticky, and then stick them together, and they will adhere just to themselves versus um, glue or a paste that might need time, air, heat, things like that to try. So each little section gets brought down. I don't want to untack the whole thing at once and then have it move around or untack areas that are across from each other and pull on one side that will affect the other. So I'm just going to keep working my way down and around, working back and forth between the different areas. When I get to the toes and to the heel area, there's a lot of extra fullness to work with. So I'm very carefully creating little tiny, tiny wrinkles in this. The important thing is not that I have as few wrinkles as possible, it's that the wrinkles don't go over the edge. Wrinkles under the foot, between the sole layers, totally fine. I can work that down, that is seam allowance. We're gonna clip it just like we would for clothing. So any of those extra little bits sticking up, I can pare them down, clip them down, hammer it and make sure that it is as flat as possible. But if there are wrinkles and ridges over the edge of the shoe, well, then that becomes a problem because that's visible. It's no longer hidden between the soles. So that's where the time and effort goes into making sure that each one of these layers is as flat as possible. And then I can add in the heel cap, which I really need to start putting this in before I last the upper it should be cemented to the upper in the right place and then the whole thing put together as one. But I'm going to be honest with you, the idea of trying to place that in the upper and get it exactly in the right position kind of scares me. So I am still going to keep doing it this way where I cement it around the edges enough and shove it in there and get it placed correctly and trim it down. And then I can kind of pull the exterior back up and over. Is it the ideal way of doing it or even the correct way of doing it? Probably not. But I feel like I need a little bit more practice with this type of shoe before I am ready to take on the correct way of doing it and trust that I know what I'm doing. After the lining is in, then it's time to start carefully cementing down all of the exterior portions.
there's a little bit of extra special work happening at the toe here because I have those two layers. So the first layer was pulled down and around and flattened out a bunch because the other one's going to get cemented over it. So I don't need a ton of seam allowance holding it into place. I'm also roughing it up so that way the cement is holding to it a little bit better. And I'm going to very carefully wrap this second layer because this is the one that will be visible on the exterior of the shoe. So I want to make sure that any of those wrinkles happen below the fold line in a place where it's going to be hidden by the outsole. So I'm taking my time to smooth over the corners, smooth over the edges and get that shaped out before I get into dealing with all those tiny little pipes and wrinkling it in as best I can to be as flat as possible. You can sometimes stretch your leather a lot doing this, but it does require it to be wet. And I did find that when I wet this down, the water does show marks. So I wanted to add as little water as possible. You just wet down those little pipes just a smidge before I went in with the hammer to flatten them down, went in with my tiny scissors, certainly use a knife for this, but I find I have a little bit better control over the tiny little space that I'm working in with my scissors and clip out as much as I can before going back and finishing up the last few little bits that need to be cemented down of the uh, exterior. Everything is coming in nice and smooth, which is the really important part, especially when I'm working with a last that is this curvy. It is not terribly forgiving, to be honest. Once everything is in place, I have to pare down that final layer, making sure to get rid of the ridges around the edges, basically just reducing as much bulk as possible. This is just like trimming your seam allowances around curves. The concave empty space in the middle of the shoe then needs to be filled. Pretty commonly in modern shoes, we use a type of cork filler. This is what's really simple to work with, really clean and efficient. They used all sorts of strange things historically, whether it was fabric or wool, it's just loose fibers. But cork is really easy to work with and it helps keep the layers from squeaking. So you don't have the leather insole and sole working against each other when they're slightly wet. It also means that there's a little bit of cushion, a little bit of warmth. So it is really a useful thing to have a good filler level there, not just for the aesthetics of the external of the shoe, not having a bumpy outsole, but also for those added benefits. I am cutting this quite wide. So it's actually extending over the seam allowance of the uppers and I'm going to then cut it down and work it down with my rasp and file it to get where it needs to be to have a really smooth curve. And I've tried fitting it into the precise space where the seam allowance ends before, but there's always a little bit of a gap or a little bit of overlap. There's always an imperfect edge there. So it's far easier to overextend and then pare it down. Now this is where I pick up with my mistake. This is the second shoe that I'm working on at this point. And usually this would just be the layers for the heel. This is going to be a stacked leather heel, not something I've done a lot. In fact, I've only really done it once before on a large scale. And I did that with a welt and the welt sticks out further than the edge of the shoe. And that was kind of my problem here. I didn't account for my outsole to stick out as far as it needed to. So when I put the sole on the first shoe, it was way too small and I was going to end up with building down to a heel that was going to be way too small. So I needed a bigger chunk at the top, which meant that I could cut a whole new outsole for both of them with a larger heel base in the back, or I could kind of cheat my way through because I'd already gotten pretty far in the first one and there was a, a way for me to only have to undo a little bit then and not waste all that leather of adding this little extra wedge. And this is essentially functioning not unlike having a welt around the top, but it's going to allow me to expand the size of the heel by just a little bit. Everything's going to be angled and getting narrower and narrower down the shape of the heel. And this will allow me another almost quarter of an inch around each one of the edges because of the angle I'm working at. So it makes a really big difference to add this one piece in. I'm definitely going to do better on the next pair though because I now know to leave that section far wider. So I'm cutting it down, paring it down, trying to flatten it out. We're working over a curve right now and I'm trying to get rid of that curve as much as possible, roughing everything up so that way when I'm adhering the layers together, they are more likely to adhere, just like scoring clay or something like that. And then going through and marking out on the uppers 
where the edge of the sole is going to hit because I don't need to cement any further than that. It's not a big deal if I do. You can use one of the little crepe rubber erasers to get rid of that, but it's still better if you don't go too far over the edge. So once I have everything cemented and that is cured, putting the layers together, the outsole is pretty damp at this point, but not soaking wet. So that way there's still enough pliability. I can curve it into the correct shape, get it around all of those complex edges. You can see it's still pretty curved around the back there. We'll have to keep correcting that on every level of the heel in order to end up with a flat surface to walk on. And I'm using a little bit of tape here just to really get that waist area tight in. You can also see the toes sticking out. I added a little bit of extra cement there because it wasn't sticking as well as I wanted it to. So I was letting that cure while I worked on other parts. And now I'm able to start shaping out the very beginning part of the heel. There's going to be a lot of work to get this shaped out correctly along the way. And I'll keep going back and fidgeting with it, but I need somewhere to start. I'm also going in and taking off the top layer of the leather, making sure that I can get rid of that curve as I go down. I'm only going as far as the heels are going to stack onto this though, so I'm not removing that in the areas that will be visible later, but this allows me to flatten it out as well as roughen it up so that way it adheres well to the next layer. It is incredibly important when building up these layers and layers of leather for higher heels. It's not too high of a heel in this case, but still, the, the concept still stands on that. So once I have everything roughed up and prepped in that back area as flat as possible, I'm going in and adding just a few little wooden pegs. I'm not going all the way around like I will for the other layers because honestly, I don't think there's quite enough depth to catch there. But by putting just the four wooden pegs in the back section of the heel through the two layers that are now there will help keep them close to each other and keep things from shifting around. The reason for the pegs is to make sure that as you're putting impact on the heel layers, they aren't shifting forwards and backwards as you're going. The Cement does a really good job of making sure that they are going to stay attached to each other, but they can start to shift just a little bit every time you put your foot down and it adds up. So those pegs are in there to make sure that we don't have any shifting of the layers long term. But each one of these layers gets added on, worked down in order to flatten it out and get rid of that smoother top layer, rough it down, add more pegs. I'm offsetting the wooden pegs every single time. So that way they're not constantly just going into the one below them. And as I'm adding layers up, they'll offset enough that I can keep going back to the same spots after a while. And from there, I'm just slowly shaping them out. I'm not being aggressive with my shaping yet till I have more layers added. And then I can start to see the shape that I'm going for and I can keep shaving off bit by bit. It's really hard to picture the heel that you're working on when you only have a couple levels. together and the shape is where I like it. You can see I ended up with a bit of a shield shape for the base of the heel where it's a bit pointed in the back, which is really indicative of this era. I'm going through and smoothing out all of the lumps and bumps, starting off with a really coarse sandpaper and glassing things as well, using literally broken glass to work it down and getting every single bump out of it that I can. I admit on this pair, I was running short of time. And so the process for smoothing out the heel and finishing the edges 
circumference around the sole was not quite as precise as I would have liked it to be, but it still looks pretty good. I'm also going and staining the edges and the bottom of the sole along with the heel so that way it gets a really nice dark brown color. This seemed to be the typical coloring that I was finding for this type of upper. Obviously if it was a black upper we'd go with a black sole and dye everything to match, but the dark brown seemed to be the common option for mid-tone browns and uh, colors of shoes. I'm going in with a larger cotton ball for most of it, but then the edges I'm going in with a really fine paintbrush so that way I'm not getting anything onto the body of the shoe. Yes, I could tape this out. I could have used plastic here. I could have done lots of things to make this go much faster in the end, but honestly I feel just as precise using a paintbrush as I do with adding a bunch of tape or other things around the edges that can sometimes bleed and give me a false sense of security. Once everything is dyed though, I'm going in and burnishing the edges, smoothing them down. I have a couple different types of burnishing sticks that I use for this that have some notches or curves to them and making sure that everything is smoothed out and shiny. I can also go in and add some extra layers of things like um, tragicanth or mink oil or things like that to help up the shine. But I was finding with this leather, it had a really nice shine around the heel and edges without having to add gum tragicanth or anything. So I may come back to that in the future, but for right now it looks pretty good. The last little bit is you can see at the heel, I don't have any wooden pegs for that final layer. Instead, they have little brass nails that hold it into place and they use them a bit decoratively. There's a set of five along the back and then one at each one of the front corners to hold everything into place while still looking really lovely. These nails in the back can also be a help when it comes to the way that you walk on your shoe and wear down that area first. So those can prevent you from wearing too far into the next layer. Then it's time to remove the last, cut through all of those little ties. Thankfully, I remember to put a hole in my last this time so I can actually properly get in there with the last hook and have something to hold onto while I yank the finished shoe off. 